such a powerful day so far. And I just feel so emotional hearing everyone's stories. So thank you. My name is Katie Soros, and I'm the global advocacy consultant for T1 International. I'm also a patient. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for about 17 years now. I'm really excited to welcome you all to our global advocacy panel. We'll hear today from several of our advocates working around the world to address the most pressing needs facing people with diabetes and their communities. After the videos, you'll have a chance to have your questions answered live um, with our panelists. So we'll play the videos before we answer any questions, uh, but you can go ahead and put your questions into the chat box as they come up for you. So first up, we have Dr. Katherine Nagel from the USA talking about her own advocacy journey and the current state of the insulin crisis in the US. Good afternoon. My name is Katherine Nagel and I live in the United States. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and now I live in Boston, Massachusetts. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1991 when I was just 18 months old, which I'm sure you can imagine was pretty scary for my family. I was lucky, however, to have access to great health care and health insurance and never had difficulty obtaining my medications. With this access, I was able to grow up living a healthy life, and I ultimately went on to become a doctor. I am now in training to be an endocrinologist and I'm currently in my medical fellowship in adult and pediatric endocrinology in Boston. In my work in medicine, I witnessed daily the impact the insulin pricing crisis has on the diabetes community in the United States. I joined T1 International a few years back to help fight this crisis through policy reform on both the state and federal level. In the United States, we have developed an increasing crisis of affordability. Though insulin and diabetes supplies are generally readily available in pharmacies across the nation, the upfront cost of these items is unaffordable to most people. Our healthcare system requires you to have health insurance to afford healthcare and supplies, and the insurance system is quite patchwork. The majority of people have employment-based insurance and kids can stay on their parents' health insurance until the age of 26. The amount of coverage for health costs and prescription medications varies widely between different insurance types. Medicaid, TRICARE, and some private insurances cover prescription drugs and other health care costs well. Many private insurances, however, referred to as high deductible plans, require patients to pay for medications and other health care costs out of pocket until they reach certain maximums, which are often set quite high, like in the tens of thousands of U.S. dollars. Unfortunately, Medicare, which is our health system for our oldest citizens, has historically provided very poor prescription drug coverage and often requires our senior citizens to pay exorbitant prices for drugs. And of course, the uninsured, which totaled almost 9% of the population in 2020, have to pay full list price for their medications. Given this landscape, the list price affects the cost of medications for many Americans, though not all, as some are sheltered by decent health care insurance. Unfortunately, due to corrupt practices and misaligned market incentives, the list price for insulin has become astronomically expensive in the United States. In 1996, a vial of Hemolog, which is estimated to cost between three and six US dollars to produce, cost about $21 to purchase. In 2017, the exact same product was being sold for over $300 per vial. This represents an increase in price of over 1200% despite there being no change in the product itself. This is particularly striking because the same product, a vial of Humalog, made by the same company, Eli Lilly, in our neighboring country of Canada, costs a much more reasonable, reasonable price of about $30. And I just want to note that this pricing difference does not mean that Canada is without their own access problems, but it is this unchecked price gouging in the United States that has directly led to the insulin pricing crisis that we now face. So why has this happened? The answer is complex, but it boils down to a dysregulated market that is not set up to serve patients. There are three companies that control 96% of the insulin market. Over the last couple of decades, these companies have raised the prices for the insulins they sell in lockstep, causing them to function like a market that is immune from competition, essentially a monopoly. Unlike in many other countries, our government is banned by law from negotiating drug prices. Instead, the prices are negotiated by private companies in a non-transparent process. These companies have no incentives to lower the costs for patients, and in fact, when list prices are higher, they collectively make more money. 
Unsurprisingly, since our government was banned by law from negotiating drug prices, prices have increased exponentially in the United States. The impact on patients in the United States is severe. Multiple recent surveys have shown that one in four individuals in our country ration insulin. Young adults, particularly when they reach 26 and are forced off their parents' health plans, are most vulnerable. The graph I have here shows the average annual spending on medical costs for a person with type 1 diabetes between 2012 and 2016. You can see that the, the costs for these people has increased substantially and the amount spent on insulin alone nearly doubled during those four years from approximately 2,800 US dollars to 5,700 US dollars per person per year. So what are people doing to address this crisis? The United States has an interesting structure where policy is determined both on the state and the federal level. Depending on where you live, state laws are going to impact what, what you have access to. T1 International has organized a movement called Insulin for All that organizes advocacy on both the state and the federal level. On the state level, many Insulin for All chapters have successfully advocated for legislation to lower copay caps, increase pricing transparency, and even in the case of California, fund the production of generic insulin. These are some pictures of the Connecticut Insulin for All chapter, which I used to be a member of before I moved to Boston, advocating for the passage of a bill that ultimately capped insulin copay costs at $25 a month for state-based insurance plans and capped copays for other diabetes supplies at $100 per month. It also had provisions to provide more support to the uninsured and make insulin more readily available in cases of emergencies at pharmacies. This only applied to citizens of Connecticut because it was a state-based law. On the federal level, policy is often harder to accomplish as our federal Congress is frequently locked in gridlock. Despite insulin affordability being a bipartisan issue that most citizens care a lot about, it has been very hard to get meaningful legislation passed. This is largely because the pharmaceutical lobby spent huge amounts of money to prevent any legislation from passing that would limit their profits. Nevertheless, this past August, the federal government passed a comprehensive bill called the Inflation Reduction Act that does cap total prescription drug costs for Medicare recipients, so only our oldest citizens on Medicare, and allows the government to negotiate drug pricing in a very limited manner for the first time. There is still a long way to go to reduce insulin costs and make insulin accessible for Americans. However, the passage of this bill is a small step in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagel, for shining a light on the insulin crisis in the US, especially for the uninsured. It's really incredible to see patients getting involved in the medical field and on the front lines of care. We appreciate the update on progress in the US by Insulin for All chapters at the state and federal level. And of course, as you heard, there's still so much more to do. So now we'll hear from Laura Munyaro, who is the chapter representative for Zimbabwe Insulin for All. Laura has been doing amazing work with the other advocates at Zimbabwe Insulin for All to raise awareness and um, help educate the community in Zimbabwe on the insulin price crisis and on diabetes. I'll turn it over. Thank you for having me. I'd like to share a little bit about myself. My name is Laura Munyoro Kangulu, Global Chapter Representative for Zimbabwe. I'm a caregiver to my mother who's diabetic and is a pharmacist I'm responsible for diabetic patients I'm in contact with. It has been a tough journey seeing my mother through the lows and highs of managing her blood glucose levels and ensuring availability of her medication. As I've been assisting more patients, I've become sympathetic towards the struggles of diabetic patients, hence my passion to advocate for them. A look at diabetes in Zimbabwe. Feedback from patients showed the unequal distribution of insulin supplies across the country, which is a burden for patients and caregivers as it takes up time looking for the drugs and also travel costs are incurred. There are limited or erratic supplies at most healthcare levels, with mostly basic insulins only available. Insulin analogs and pencils are inaccessible, a drawback for those specifically recommended to use by their doctors. They can be found only in a few private pharmacies. Emergency supplies generally are unavailable 
at primary healthcare levels, yet essential for poor communities, schools, and sports kids. On to some real life examples from interviews. Patient one is a case of a type one diabetic in competitive sports who described how the sports first aid kits have no emergency insulin at all. And those attending to them have little or no knowledge on how to administer insulin. This discourages patients from competitive sports. The second case struggled to get a doctor to prescribe the appropriate insulin for him, resulting in eight years of poor health, yet very high bills. The lessons we get from here is that we need to continuously educate patients and healthcare professionals on modern insulins. Also educating patients on the category their diabetes falls in, for example, type one or type two. We need to close the gap, the knowledge gap, between uh, general practitioners and specialists, as illustrated in case two. Affordability. In government hospitals, one can only get treatment after paying consultation fees, which is a disadvantage for the poor. Specialist treatment requires more out of the pocket, sidelining the poor with severe conditions. The more recommended analogs are expensive, so patients fall back on what they can afford. Test trips are a luxury for most, resulting in fewer checks than advisable. The picture there shows one of our members illustrating that they have to use a vial instead of a pencil when funds are unavailable. What are we doing as a chapter? With guidance from T1 International, we've been working with our Department of Health to raise awareness of the plight of diabetic patients regarding access and availability of insulin through workshops, patient education flyers, Facebook, where we had our Share Your Story series, Twitter, and WhatsApp support group. That is a picture of myself presenting at the recent workshop. We hosted a workshop on diabetes and mental health in April this year, where we invited a psychologist to present. That is a picture of the Zim Insulin for All team facilitating at the workshop. We have also worked on policies with other organizations, which will ensure better access and affordability of insulin and other accessories. Thank you so much, Laura. It's so wonderful to hear what you and the other advocates of Zimbabwe Insulin for All are accomplishing. And as we continue, as we will continue to hear today, we all share challenges to the vision we have of a world where everyone has what they need. And it's really beautiful to see the people-powered, grassroots, community-driven movement that you're creating with your education and advocacy initiatives. Next up, we'll hear from Christina Barkland, who is based in Sweden, where access to healthcare and medicines is a lot more comprehensive than many countries, and yet not without its challenges. Hello, Sweden here. Sweden is number two in the hit list of T1D. We are one in 200, beaten only by our neighbor Finland. They are one in 100. We're not enough to win any election, but we must of course raise our voices. Because the fact is that the knowledge of T1D in the Swedish society is extremely low. And we with T1D are incredibly quiet, though we are one of the most affected countries in the world. At the same time, we are very well treated by our health care. But at the same time, we are forbidden to work in several occupations. And at the same time, we are expected to work full time to at least 65. Hello, I'm Christina Barklund. 62 years. I have had T1D half of my life. I'm a GP in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, where I have the responsibility for a thousand diabetics with type 2. In the middle of my med school, I got T1D. Single mother to a three-year-old girl. No one I knew or no one in my family had diabetes. So I felt like an alien. 
In med school, we learned that diabetics are sloppy and careless. So I also felt quite ashamed, worrying that I never could get a job as a doctor. If I had known that I would be here today after 30 years of good work, speaking to you all, I would have felt much less sadness and much more strength. In Sweden, all insulins and supplies are free, thanks to high taxes. Here is my table just packing for summer camp Sokketoppen, a training camp for children and teenagers with T1D. Everything to the left is free. The only things we pay for is at the right, treats as dextro and the new nasal glucagon baksimi. It cost about 150 US dollar. This freedom to have everything for free gives possibility. And what I think obligation to work further in the struggle for equal healthcare worldwide. Since the middle of 19th century, Sweden are divided in 21 healthcare regions. Every region gets their pot of money to spend as they choose. Therefore, it can differ, for example, which insulin pump you can get due to which region you belong to. Now in September, we had election in Sweden and the regions are probably being deregulated. The pandemic made it clear that the system with regions makes healthcare unequal. This is inequality in a very small scale compared to the unequal situation between different countries in the world. I'm the only representative of T1 International in Sweden. The interest is cool. I think people sit satisfied. There's also a tradition in Sweden to hide sickness. It's nothing you should talk about. You should be strong and able to take care of yourself. Very many with T1D never tell their co-workers or their managers that they have T1D, afraid losing their jobs or that they would be perceived odd. An acquaintance of mine with T1D, a real lonely rider, has for several years fought for our rights to get driving license for truck, bus and taxi. And this January we got it. Much thanks to him. Still, we are not allowed to work in the police force, as a military, at sea, in the fire brigade, or in train and air traffic. But times are changing and the struggle pays off. Other issues in Sweden is dental care. It's really expensive. Bad teeth is a distinct sign that you lack money. If you have a high HbA1c, you can get a small contribution, otherwise not. I'm right now in discussion about this with politicians and the National Board of Social Affairs and Health. Another issue is that we with T1D are expected to work full time to at least 65, no matter which job you have. In Sweden, you can relatively easy get a part-time pension before 65 if you have a chronic disease, but not for T1D. I'm in the middle of that struggle too. Lonely rider, that's not for me. So I also joined the Bon Diabetes Fonden, the Child Children Diabetic Fund, a tricky name, but I was told it's easier to get money if the word child is mentioned. We collect donations exclusively for research to cure T1D and to inform about T1D. The main donors are Lions, football organizations and private donors. Sanofi, by the way, gave 12,000 US dollars this year. Seems like a joke, remembering that Novo Nordisk 2010 gave 120 million US dollar for research. About what? T1D? No, type 2. Do Big Pharma want to contribute in finding a cure for T1D? 
or would that kill their everlasting golden cow? I think the answer is simple. To find T1 International meant for me that I'm no longer alone. To feel that power means all. Next term, I will start educating at med school about T1D. It's more than necessary that future doctors learn more and learn that we neither are sloppy nor careless. Of course, I'm going to use material from T1 International. Great. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm so happy to hear that you're going to be spreading this message um, with the medical community. And we may think that if cost is not a barrier, then everything is okay. And so it's really also helpful to hear your story and see that there's so much more to keep fighting for in terms of equity and support and an end to stigma for people with diabetes, um, even when basic needs are met. So finally, we're going to hear from Mohammed Sayam, who is based in Palestine in the Gaza Strip and has been advocating with others across the MENA region to make important changes to policies and expand access to crucial insulin and supplies in Palestine. Hello, beautiful people. Thank you so much for tuning in for our summit today. Uh, and of course, many thanks to T1 International for organizing such events that, you know, spot the light on the importance of patient advocacy throughout the globe. Uh, my name is Mohamed Siam. I'm a 24-year-old uh, medical doctor, and I represent the MENA region at T1 International. And let me start my, uh, my presentation or my speech by saying something that we all know. Diabetes or living with diabetes is never an easy job. And I think every person living with diabetes and maybe their caregivers, know exactly what I what I mean. And I think they've felt something throughout their years living with diabetes or helping with taking care of diabetes for something for someone um, when I just said what I said. And I think um, since I got my diabetes, I've been living with diabetes for about 12 years right now. And since I was a child, my family made sure to create that safe environment for me to create that support system that every person living with diabetes needs especially in communities where discrimination and stigma against people li living with diabetes is at high, high um, levels. And maybe this helped me a lot throughout my early years and maybe grow up with me to the point where right now I know how important it is to support people, to help them, to raise awareness, to educate people. And it kept growing with me when I joined, uh, when I started med school. Um, you know, to the point where I felt like, okay, um, right now I'm going to be that middle chain between the healthcare system and the community to understand both vision, to understand both views and try as much as I can to help, to educate, to talk to stakeholders, because, you know, we all feel that responsibility, that eagerness to, to do something and to help the community that we belong to. Advocacy is never an easy job. We all know that. Um, it's not easy to, to hold a meeting with a stakeholder. Um, sometimes the community doesn't support your actions or your activities. Um, and I think maybe throughout the past few years, COVID has hit us very hard and created some sort of disturbance throughout our works or our work or plans. So it's a lesson that I've learned, you know, that I had to know my limits. I need to know how to organize my time, how not to feel burned out with um, without with my work, sometimes with activities that have been you know postponed or cancelled just because of the environment around me not supporting my my idea, or maybe just because you know it, it was not the right time or the right moment for it. And I think at the beginning of each journey, we always have that you know eagerness, that energy that we need to spend on a specific activity or a specific uh, project that we start with. But um, it, it's important to learn from our lessons. It's important to stay on track and, of course, keep a positive mindset throughout our advocacy journey to, to create a change. Yes, advocacy takes time. Yes, it's just you know, a matter of multiple small steps till you reach the goal that you want to reach. But at the end of the day, you will reach that goal and you'll help yourself and, of course, other people living with diabetes around you. In Palestine, in specific, let me say that the situation was different before and after June 2021. So before that, insulin vials were available in the government clinics. But other than that, if you want, if I want, let's say, for example, a doctor prescribes 
uh, an insulin analog, an insulin or some type of insulin analog for me. This means that I need to buy it out of, out of my own pocket. If I need um, test strips, I need to buy that out of my own pocket. If I need CGMs, those are not available in Palestine. So I need to order that online. Shipping takes a lot of time. It's extremely, extremely tough for, to get things online to the Gaza Strip. Sometimes it might take it might take months to get those. So it was hard. It was rough. Doctor visits, especially endocrinology visits, are paid. So you need to pay that out of your own bucket to visit a, a private clinic. We have no registry or database system. So we had a lot of problems. And of course, throughout years of advocacy, uh, we started to change things a little bit. And I think uh, we've got some sort of help following the May 2021 attacks on the Gaza Strip to act on um, getting insulin analogs available for free for every people, for every person living with diabetes in the Gaza Strip and in Palestine in general. And we've achieved that with the WHO up updated their essential drug list to include insulin analogs. So it was um, some sort of a PowerPoint for us to, to uh, spread this knowledge to the stakeholders and insist on the importance of getting insulin analogs to people living with diabetes. Um, and this was um, a milestone for us. It was an achievement that we were able to achieve um, back in June 2021. And yes, I feel amazingly when I talk about this, uh, when I talk about all the efforts that we've, we've been able to achieve or to do um, locally, regionally and globally throughout, through, you know, enormous support from um, organizations. T1 International was um, represented by um, by Katie in one of our meetings that we had post or following the um, the attacks on the uh, on the Gaza Strip in 2021, so a lot of actions, a lot of things were happening back then, and a lot of things were aligned together to for us to reach that point. Um, let me say that uh, regionally, the things, the situation is not that different because I think multiple countries around the region share the same cultures, we're the same people, almost the same healthcare systems. So it's not that much of a difference. And we face a lot of challenges that can be related to the community, such as the stigma or to the healthcare system that, that we belong to or we work with, such as um, the non-updated information, the lack of availability and affordability to insulin and supplies and, you know, etc. We as the as a regional team, as you know, a lot of advocates working from the from different countries around the region, try as much as we can to improve that, to work with stakeholders, to create plans, to make actions, to help people living with diabetes in multiple countries around the region, having the main slogan that we're having um, today in this summit, health is wealth. So we fight for our rights in the region, hoping to create something by helping each other, by supporting each other's plans, by doing everything that we could to reach the point that we want to reach uh, for each country um, as soon as possible. So moral of the story, I just want to say that, you know, we should never give up on our uh, on what we're doing, because even though advocacy takes time, even though sometimes it might feel like you're taking very small steps, that your voice is not loud, uh, but believe me, it is. No matter how small you think your voice is, or no matter how very little your actions might be, you're creating something, you're helping people. Um, and I'm sure that we'll all reach a point where we're extremely proud of our actions, of the help, of the support that we're um, um, receiving and giving to people around us. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for being part of this of the diabetes community, of this community, because I know that I'm being supported. I know that I support others and I know how amazing it is to belong to a community that works to the same aim all around the globe, to providing insulin for all, to help people, to help other people living with diabetes all across the globe. So um, let me just say that um, let's keep fighting, fingers crossed that we'll hopefully reach a goal, reach all of our goals to uh, to insulin for all to health as well and um thank you all for listening i'm sorry if i've been a little bit um you know um more in time so yeah see you soon thank you oh thank you so much to dr mohammed sayam um i am just so touched and and it's just such a wonderful experience to hear from these amazing advocates so i want to welcome all of our panelists back up thanks everyone okay here we all are 
And so we just want to open it up for questions. I know there were some in the chat, um, but if you want to ask your question verbally, you can also raise your hand and um, under the reactions button and you can ask your questions aloud. So it looks like some questions have come in. And I'm still, we're still waiting on a couple more. And I know that one question was specifically for Dr. Nagel and that was um, great. I'm seeing my questions now. And that was about, um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing my questions, but um, the, the question for Dr. Nagel was specifically about what we can do in the US. If whoever asked that question, can you pop it back in the chat, please? <laughs> How do we put more pressure on California Governor Newsom about manufactured insulin locally? Is that a question you could tackle for us? Um, sure, I can try. Um, so I think um, California actually passed some interesting legislation recently to start making generic insulin that would be significantly cheaper than what's available on the market. Um, the problem with the legislation is it doesn't take in, it doesn't come into effect for, uh, I forget exactly what year, but it doesn't come into effect for a couple of years. And then there's a lot of barriers to actually making that generic insulin will only be for um, it in California. But I think that the movement to make generic insulin is um, a good idea because right now the US is basically functioning as a, um, it's a, it's a, they want it to be like a free market, but it's not a free market because um, pharma has such a monopoly on the insulin. And so if we can introduce a cheaper um, insulin into the pool, that would be extremely helpful for um, Americans with diabetes. I think targeting Governor Newsom in California specifically, um, I don't know exactly what to do there, except for keep sharing our stories and advocating as we do, um, but yeah. Great, thank you so much. So another question has come in from Charles. The question is, big pharma is intimidating. What advice do you have to advocates? And this can be answered by anyone on the call. Laura, if you can turn your camera on, we can't see you. There we go. Yes, um, I think I could try to tackle that one. It's a very difficult one because we are dealing with um, powerful people people who have run the system for a very, very long time. Um, but what I've just realized so far is the cry of any person can surely open doors. And from what we have seen, any of the, the people who have come up with their stories, who have shared their stories, have surely knocked on someone's heart, has surely opened someone's ear. So it might not be the big farmer directly, but any of the people around. Now I'm talking about communities. I'm talking about schools. I'm talking about um, basically people in the healthcare teams. Once you speak to them and they hear you, they are sort of compelled to hear what you say and it becomes a whole team against Big Pharma on its own. And I'm hoping that with time, Big Pharma will then realize that, you know, they can't really work against a whole people. So if you look at it from the perception of starting with educating, um, educating the communities, educating the healthcare professionals themselves on the impact that um, lack of insulin basically has on the people. I think that can open ground to a lot more voices. Um, with that education comes knowledge. We, we, we spread the knowledge of the importance of insulin. We spread the knowledge, uh, equating it basically to water. If people run around to make sure a community that has no water gets water because they know the importance of water um, in a life's person, then surely we are saying insulin is almost as equal as not having water in your system. 
So we just need to work on ground level, starting with research, starting with educating uh, the people out there. Once we do that, Big Pharma, I have realized, listens more to the healthcare professionals because they speak to, um, you know, they sell to, they, they, they market their products in that direction, you know, of the healthcare professionals. So when the healthcare team gets to understand and gets to be passionate, compassionate, you know, um, and understanding what the patient is going through, then they themselves can also help us. They can back us up in our cry as we speak to, to the pharmaceutical companies, uh, which is what we have been trying to do um, in Zimbabwe as a Zimbabwean team, starting with the, the education, starting with uh, letting people share their stories, starting with spreading, spreading that out on social media so that people get to acknowledge knowledge um, what, uh, you know, the T1 communities, basically the, you know, type 1 diabetes patients or insulin users are using. And mind you, they're moving more towards giving um, patients more insulin, especially um, those who are even on type 2 diabetes, you know, who are poorly controlled. So it means we're going to have so many insulin users out there who are going to be crying and be in need of that insulin. You know, we need to have analogs available, of which right now it's mostly just the vials that are uh, that are available. So if we work with that groundwork and we sensitize more and more people, just as we have been doing, just like what T1 International is doing, that cry will surely land on someone's ear. I think that's what I can say for now. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Do any of our other panelists want to add, building off of what Laura said or answering the question about what advocates can do? Um, well, for, for me personally, I think you know, adding up to things like that, to what Laura just mentioned, because I think she mentioned like almost everything that could add, that could get to our minds when, when we were asked this question. But I think pharma companies in, in, in every country are linked directly to, to the government or to, to the Ministry of Health, to, um, to, to people who are taking or making decisions. And this is happening because of something that was mentioned previously in the, in the panel, the monopoly that is happening because of those pharma companies and how they affect the healthcare system, how they pay money in order to, uh, you know, to be viewed as um, as the good side of, uh, of the healthcare system or things like that. So I think tackling such, a, such issues should start also by um, going to health to, sorry, to healthcare uh, decision makers or policy makers in order to switch the views of how they work with the pharmaceutical companies and how can we uh, get the maximum benefit of the pharmaceutical companies in order to support the people, for example, living with diabetes and support their needs, uh, and especially talking about insulin affordability and availability in, in every country around the world. Great, so I'm gonna move us to, um, I think two more questions. So we have a hand raised. Pilar, do you wanna ask your question live? You can go ahead, Pilar, just unmute yourself and you should be able to ask. We should be able to hear you now, Pilar. No. Why don't we just go to, um, Chris, let's see, I have one more question and Christina, I see you have your hand raised. Um, if in your answer to, oh. um, okay, go for it. Can We can hear you. Uh, sorry, I, I missed that. I, I don't have my hand raised. <laughs> okay, so thank you. That's okay. But, 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 but I can say that I think we, will, uh, we must confront them, the big pharma, uh, and uh, in the media so people will know. People are unaware what's happening to us around the world. No one in Sweden knows that uh, how, how the situation is in US or in Zimbabwe, no one knows. 
Absolutely. We all need to be raising awareness in our own countries and around the world. And thank you for that, Christina. So we'll ask one more question. Um, and it might be that Pilar is able to put hers into the chat. Um, but the question now is how have supply chain shortages or interruptions affected insulin or delivery devices availability and price? And how should we take that into account in our advocacy? This is for all, so I would say if it's easier to think about, um, does, I know that there are a lot of both natural and political conflicts and disasters that happen uh, around the world. And so if you could speak to um, maybe how you navigate those times when there's an emergency. And Mohammed, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, regarding the shortage, it's, it's something I, I guess, any second and third world countries or developing countries in general suffer from, um, whenever you get, for example, a donation for a couple of years of insulin, and then it cuts down, this means that there's a shortage because of an international problem or because of that shortage happening. And this, of course, affects the lives of people being living with diabetes, because right now, like, for example, you, you're being dependent on this supply, on the governmental uh, supply uh, that is being supplied, of course, because of the, interna the international law, uh, in an international level. So our lives being uh, dependent on that means that this affects uh, every aspect of our lives. And if, if such shortages are, you know, are not dealt with as soon as possible or are not taken into consideration as, uh, as a main pillar in the treatment or in the management of, uh, of people living with diabetes, for example, this means that uh, the international society or, or you know, ministries of health are not actually like looking into the importance of such of such problems, and are not caring uh, enough for for the lives of people living with diabetes, especially as I mentioned in developing countries. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, thank you all for your answers. And this has been an extremely powerful and informative session. Um, and we have to wrap up here. Thank you all. Thank you.